next speaker is another UMBC, current UMBC graduate student, PhD student, Melinda Jackson, who is a student in the laboratory of David Eisenman in the Department of Biological Sciences. And Belinda's talk will have a title that um, perhaps only a true developmental biologist can appreciate. Um, which way did they went in search of the elusive C. elegans went pathway target genes? Good morning, everyone. Um, as Dr. Miller just, suggest, uh, just mentioned to you, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Biological Sciences Department, and my research is being done under the mentorship of Dr. David Eisen. Which way did they went in search of the C. elegans went pathway target genes? Uh, research I'd like to present to you today. Our, the major focus of our laboratory is to under, have a better understanding of cell fate specification. A lot of people have mentioned that already today in this session. Um, we want to know how a mother cell divides, giving birth to two identical daughters, which ultimately have non-identical fates, which appear at fate A and fate B. And more specifically, we're interested in how extracellular signaling pathways facilitate this differentiation. Typically, uh, the sending cell, which is, is perhaps um, a neighboring cell, will send out signaling molecules that will only be when we reach the environment of one of the daughter cells. And this will start a transduction of various um, protein cascades that will end up with the um, expression or turning on of specific target genes to that signaling pathway. So the daughter which receives the signal turns on the target genes of that signaling pathway. The daughter which does not receive the signal does not turn on this target and therefore takes on a different fate. The link signaling pathway is one such extracellular signal transduction pathway. And it's the one we are most interested in studying in our laboratory. It is a highly conserved signal transduction pathway. In fact, we see components of it in organisms as diverse as humans to hydra. It regulates multiple cellular processes, such as those listed here. And in turn, those processes facilitate both development and homeostasis. And as I mentioned, we are specifically interested in cell fate specification. When this pathway goes awry, there are a number of developmental defects and diseases that um, occur. Some of those are listed here. And one of the things that really brought the link pathway into the forefront of research is the fact that in 85% of diagnosed colorectal cancers this pathway is being overactivated. So this is a depiction of the core components of the pathway. Um, and I'll just step you through this. So in the absence of the signal, in the absence of the ligand, there's a degradation complex that's formulated in, in the uh, cytoplasm. And it holds in check this major transcriptional activator, beta-catenin. Beta-catenin being in close pro in proximity to two kinases is phosphorylated, which tags it for ubiquitination and degradation. And because the activator, the transcriptional activator, is being held in check, it is not in the nucleus, and therefore the target genes of this pathway are turned off. However, in the presence of the signaling molecule, the went ligand, this destruction um, pathway, uh, excuse me, destruction complex associates beta catenin is no longer phosphorylated or marked for degradation, and therefore it accumulates, eventually translocating into the nucleus, where it interacts with its bi um, binding cofactor, TCF. And together, these two um, make up a co-transcriptional activator, which turn on the target genes of the signaling pathway. TCF brings target specificity in that it contains the DNA binding domain of this complex, and they continue to the activation domain, which recruits the necessary proteins for the start of transcription. So, um, although we know a lot about how this pathway works, one of the questions that still remains out there is, what exactly are these target genes? What are the target genes that are specific, say, for a neuronal cell versus a hypodermal cell? And um, using the model organism C. elegans is how we are approaching this. So let me introduce you to our laboratory pet. C. elegans is a non-parasitic, free-living, soil-dwelling, transparent nematode. It's depicted here in its adult form. It develops from embryo to a reproductive adult in approximately three and a half days, which means it's a very easy um, organism to watch develop. It has five distinct anatomical systems, which are listed here. And so that gives us the various cell types that we can look at and see how they actually um, are, are produced versus each other. It uses conserved mechanisms of development, such as signaling pathways. And there's a myriad um, of available genetic resources, which makes it very easy for us to utilize this and look at genetic comparison. So for instance, we actually know the lineage from a single cell to the 1,000 cells, approximately 1,000 cells, that are seen in the adult worm. 
and we can watch each of these be born and where they migrate to and the cell death processes that occur. So it's a great organism for this sort of research. Additionally, um, C. elegans has most of the four components, homologs, most of the four components in the meant signaling pathway. But for the sake of today's talk, we're only going to focus on two, one of beta catenin homologs bar one and the TCF homolog pop one. And just to remind you where these fall in the pathway, they're highlighted in red. Also in the worm, there are a number of developmental processes that we know are affected by wind pathway signaling. Um, in the absence of signaling, these, these particular cell fates do not occur. And as is, I mentioned um, is the norm, or as I mentioned with vertebrate systems, we don't know many of the targets in the worm either. A few of them are listed here, um, but for most of these, we don't even know if they're direct or indirect targets of the pathway. So that brings me to the basic question in my research. What are the wind responsive target genes that drive cell fate specification? And I am approaching this question in three steps. First, using a microarray analysis, I want to identify the target genes. Using quantitative PCR, I will then verify that those genes identified are actually verified um, wind responsive. And finally, I want to do a characterization of the targets that I find through expression analysis, promoter analysis, and phenotypical analysis. So I've begun this. Number one, with target identification through microarray analysis. Um, I did a comparison of two conditions. Animals that were exposed to wild type levels of wind signaling, and those are exposed to overactivated levels. And we can do this by using the variant of the beta catenin, which is a stable form, it is not degraded. So even in the absence of the signal, there's enough beta catenin produced to those translocate and target genes are turned on. And just as a reminder of the types of things we would find in microarray analysis, this depicts what a wild type intensity might look like versus a target gene which is induced, where the brighter the signal is, the more of the uh, transcript that is made. And in fact, the results of this experiment using the Appymetrix C. elegans gene array, which contains more than 22,000 possible transcript tags, I've identified 117 putative genes that are upregulated by twofold or more. As a proof of concept, bar one, which is the, um, the uh, induced gene that we utilize here is up by 25 fold. Supportive to previous information that this pathway is auto regulatory to the components of the pathway, PRI1 axon and LIN17, which is one of the wind receptors, are also up. And however, the known targets that I listed before did not show up in this particular analysis. And there are a couple of reasons that that may have happened. Perhaps the pathway was stimulated at a developmental point that was not conducive to those genes being turned on or perhaps those genes are being expressed in too few cells and are masked on background. The second step was to verify these target genes by quantitative PCR analysis. And here I added a third condition, which is an under-induced or under-activated pathway. And I did this by using a transgene that's a dominant negative of the other transcriptional activator, um, POP1. So here, POP1 and BAR1 cannot interact with each other. POP1 still sequesters, however, the regulatory regions of the target gene. So this causes an inhibited pathway um, situation. And so what I've seen in here of the 117 candidates first identified, 27, 27 of them actually tested um, positive as bar one responsive. And the criteria for that is that in the overactivated pathway, we have a two-fold increase over the wild type. And in the inhibited pathway, we see a two-fold decrease or we see no change at all in comparison to the control. So some of the notable things um, that came out of this analysis is that 13 of the candidates identified had no known function, they are novel. 13 of them have been studied for other reasons, but were not ever known to be responsive to wind signaling, so this is a new finding. One of the candidates is actually a negative regulator of the entire pathway. And most interestingly to me is that five of these candidates, the largest subset, are actually collagen genes. So let me tell you a little bit about collagen. In, in um, mammals, collagens are a major component of the extracellular matrix, and it's typically um, responsible for the architectural structure of both cells and tissues. It's found in all of these different types of, um, of tissues, and it's partially responsible for skin strength and elasticity, as well as strengthening blood <coughs> In the worm, it is a major component of the cuticle, which is the exoskeleton of the worm. It regulates body size and shape, so this is a, a sort of parallel function to what it does in higher organisms. The cuticle is reshed and to be secreted four times at each developmental point. And it contains different collagen subsets, and in fact the worm has approximately 150 collagens, 
Um, but I've only noticed that five that definitely are upregulated by the pathway, and a handful that are sort of marginal. Um, gene expression of these collagens is very tightly regulated temporally, and as far as and also within the oscillation cycle, the point in each larval development, um, larval mode that it, it occurs in. So our hypothesis is that perhaps the link signaling pathway is actually directing the um, um, upregulation of a subset of these collagens. And so I'm looking at this with my phenotypic analysis, and in fact I see by using the promoter or regulatory region of each of these identified targets, and hooking it up to a yellow fluorescent protein, I'm able to visualize in which cell in the, which cells in the worms and at what point in development these collagens are typically turned on. And they are expressed primarily in the hypodermal cells, which you would expect because those are the cells that actually secrete the cuticle. And further of interest, what I've noticed is that when I look at these um, transgene, trans reporter genes, and the di different conditions of the link pathway, for instance, when the link pathway is upregulated, I see expression in a large number of animals at a time point that typically does not express that um, very much. So the L3 versus in the overactivated versus L3 in the control. And even more interestingly, in the inhibited um, conditions, we don't see expression either at L3 or L4. So this is the type of analysis that I'm currently doing with some of these targets. Cold 38 is another one, again expressed in the hypodermis. Um, this time in L3, L4, and the adult stages, I see more animals that are expressing this reporter than in the control. And LOM3, which is another, is a little bit different. It's expressed both in the L2 as well as in the um, adult uh, time frames. Um, and although with overactivation, we don't see more animals expressing it, there is a change in intensity. So I think that this will prove to be a pretty interesting result, too, to show that they are not all regulated in the same manner. So in conclusion, I would like to just remind you of what I told you using microarray analysis. I've identified approximately 117 upregulated gene candidates. We target gene verification by quantitative PCR. 27 of these are verified as link responsive, and notably, there's a subset of particular collagens that came out of this analysis. And for ongoing future work, I am going to continue with my YSP reporters to do um, analysis of expression patterns, promoter analysis eventually by knocking out the POP1 binding site to see if expression goes away and also phenotypical analysis using RNAi and mutant or deletion um, to see whether or not there's an actual morphogenic sort of phenotype that I can see in the animal's gum condition they rupture more frequently because of the integrity of the cuticle and that sort of thing. So in conclusion, I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. David Eisenman, and my colleagues, Julie Kenny, Ruby, and Lakshmi, all very helpful, keep, keep us sane. A couple of undergrads that have helped me over various summers. Um, special thanks to my collaborators at NIH, Michael Krauss and Lee Chen, as well as Dr. Korsagen, who is in um, Holland, the Hosmer Lab, which are, uh, is located in College Park, and the Sabin Lab, which is at Johns Hopkins. And of course, I'd like to thank Meyerhoff and um, Park and Bramble for my support and the NSF grant that my mentor has and an NIH grant that I was fortunate enough to secure before the purse strings tightened up. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. <coughs>